you probably know what it feels like to go on a brand new school campus and not know where your next class is. You ever had that feeling? I've had that feeling. The first day I was at La Paz Intermediate School, I had no idea where to go. And it was a stressful time because you probably know how this feels. You've got all these classes to get to, but you only have four minutes to get there. And sometimes, you, it's not just, you know, you're jumping from one door to another. Sometimes you're walking all the way across campus. Sometimes you've got to walk really fast, and if you don't walk really fast and in a totally straight line, you can't get there on time. And I remember those first couple days, it was really helpful to have people who knew the campus help me out. So you might have been led around on a tour by like a teacher or an administrator, or maybe you sought out an eighth grader. Or maybe your older brother or sister helped you around to figure out where's the science building, where's the math building, where's the English building, where should I go? That idea of you needing to be led is something that applies to what we're going to talk about today. The Bible says that you're all led in many different directions. And we can just tell that by the way that you interact with one another. You are led and influenced by people. Now, that's not a bad thing. The Bible actually says that can be a really good thing. And the Bible says today in the book of Philippians that you ought to be led in a certain direction. But just know that as you're being led by other people and other things, you need to make sure you are being led in the right direction. That's what I want to look at in the book of Philippians. So please open up in your Bibles to the book of Philippians. I'd love for everyone to pull out their Bibles and check it out. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, 18, 19. We're going to look at three verses where Paul basically describes two types of people. And he says, these people will influence you. Two types of people. He says, you just need to make sure you're following one of them and you're not following this other group of people that he's going to talk about. If you remember last week, if you were here, Paul said, you need to make sure that your goal in life is to be more perfect. Right? Not just for the sake of you know, looking better or being stronger or healthier. No, what he means is you need to be more like Christ. That's what it means to be perfect. So if that's the goal of Christians, if that's the goal of the Christian life, this is one way that we do it. Check out verse 17. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. Imitating means copying. Right? If you've ever... Um, seen something your parents do and you like make fun of them or see something your siblings do and you like kind of parrot what they do back at them, right? Sometimes we say that's imitating. Or if you've ever um, seen like celebrity impressions, you ever seen those? Where like one celebrity pretends to talk like another celebrity or maybe you do an impression of, you know, someone who's annoying or whatever, like you, you talk like them or you copy their voice, you say the words they do, right? And sometimes it's good and fun, but other times it's mean. But in this situation, he says, I want you to imitate us. And specifically, he says, me, follow my lead. I'm leading you in a direction and I want you to do what I do. And then he says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So he doesn't just say, follow me and I'm the standard and that's it, just follow me. He says, follow me and also, follow anyone who's leading a godly life. Not just Paul, and for us that's hard, right? Because it's like, Paul's not around. Right? You can't technically follow Paul. All you can do is read the Bible and see what he has to say and try to follow his life in that way, but you can't actually see him in action. You can't actually see him and do what he does. You can't see him acting out in real time. But the Bible says right here that you're supposed to keep your eyes on people who set that good example. So it's possible. You have people in your life. Your, your parents, for some of you, are good examples. Some of you have leaders in life. Some of you have aunts and uncles and grandparents. Some of you have coaches who are a good example, a godly example in your life. And what he says is you've got to follow those people. Verse 18, this is the other type of people that he, you, you shouldn't follow. Verse 18, he says, For many of whom I have often told you. So I've, I've warned you about these people. And now... I tell you, even with tears, what he's about to say, it makes him sad. So sad, he says, like, I want to cry about this. This is how sad this is to me. That many walk as enemies of the cross. There are a lot of people in this world, some of them go to this church, some of them are in your small group, some of them went to this church in Philippi, many of them walk as enemies of the cross. Instead of setting a good and godly example for people to follow, they are actively leading people into sin, whether they know it or not. Many of them know it, and others do it without even understanding what they're doing. They walk as enemies of the cross. What that means is, you know, the work of Jesus is signified in the cross. 
If you walk as an enemy of that, you're opposing what Jesus is doing. That's all it basically means. And then he describes those people in verse 19. He says, these are the people you shouldn't follow. People whose end is destruction. And he says, their God is their belly, right? That doesn't mean they're all like super fat or pregnant looking, like they have a big belly and they rub it like the Buddha little statues that you see in the Chinese restaurants, right? That's not what it's talking about. But what it is saying is their God, what that means is what they follow, the thing that they care most about and they'll do anything to please is their belly, right? Does that mean they all eat a lot of food? Well, not necessarily. What it means is your belly was like symbolic for your appetites, the things you want. Basically, people who do whatever they want to do. If something makes them happy, they do it. If something uh, makes them popular and they want that, they do it. If something makes them look cool and they want that, they do that. If something makes them look funny to people and it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, I don't care. I'm going to do that. Their God is their belly, their appetites. Another thing, he says, and they glory in their shame. That means is these people that Paul says, don't follow these examples. They're people who instead of being ashamed of the bad things they do, the things they know are sinful, instead of being ashamed of that, they glory in it. That means they're proud of it. They brag about it. And it's like people who do sinful things and post about it. And they're excited to tell you, oh, I disrespected my parents. It was so cool. And then I just cussed at this guy and it was so awesome and it felt so good. Like, the, like that is people who glory in their shame that are excited to tell you about the th sinful things they do. Things they should be ashamed of, but instead they're proud of. Then it says, their minds are set on earthly things. All they care about is the here and now. All they care about is popularity, money, food, whatever. Looking good, being liked, that's all they care about. These people who are bad influences. So you can see there's two types of people. People who follow Paul, Paul's example and Christ's example, and people who lead others to sin. What I'm telling you today is in your life, you've got those two types of people in your life too. There are people in your life that will lead you in a godly direction. There are people in your life who will lead you in a sinful direction. What you need to do is set yourself up to be led by those godly people. To, in some situations, avoid those sinful influencers. In many situations, not listen to what they have to say and instead follow what you hear these godly people do. So the first point, what I want you to write down for point number one is this. Find and follow godly influencers. That comes from verse 17. Find and follow godly influencers. It says, brothers, join in imitating me. Do what I do. There are people that I imitate, people that I do impressions of, um, and sometimes it's on accident. Uh, I have, since I got married, picked up some things that my wife says and does. She has these little quirks and little things that are like funny responses that now I find myself saying, and I'm like, oh, I can't believe I just said that. The other day, she caught me, she's like, oh, that's something I do, that's something I do, that's something I do. Oh, I'm, I'm rubbing off on you, I, you're becoming like me, and I'm like, no, it's, no. Um, it's actually probably good if she rubs off on me a little bit more, like, I'd probably be better off if, if I was more like her, but um, anyway, I was like, I can't believe I just said that Disney quote, like, I am so, what happened to me? Like, I, did, I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just did that. Right? And it's not a bad thing, right? And same way in your life, you've got people that influence you, for good or for bad. You've got people in your life who say certain things and live a certain way, and then you find yourself doing it. I know this because many of you are not the oldest. Some of you are the second born or the third born. And I actually happen to know your older siblings. And something that's very funny is that you, many of you, act very similarly to your older siblings. I'm looking at you, Josiah Yovichin. You're exactly like your brother. You guys, <laughs> it's kind of true. Um, a lot of you act similar to your older siblings. That's not a bad thing, right? But you've seen their example, and whether you've wanted to or not, you followed their example. Others of you have parents that make these facial expressions and laugh a certain way. And then you come into the ministry, I'm like, I know your parents, and you laugh just like that. You look just like that. Oh man, you are their kid. Sometimes I, because I see you guys all the time, I meet you, and I know who you are, and I'm like, I've never met your parents. They walk in the room, I'm like, <gasps> that's an older version of Brody. Like, uh, that's an older version of Luke. Oh man, like there's people that I recognize your parents after I recognize you, and it's crazy, because you look like them, and that's just, biological, right? And there are other things that you pick up that they do, and that's not a bad thing. But I just want you to recognize this. You are moldable, and, and you're able to be influenced. 
And some of you think, no, not me. No, like, I'm a, I'm a trailblazer. I'm a trendsetter. Nobody, nobody can make me do anything. Well, the truth is, that's not true. <laughs> it's just not true. Here's what the Bible says in the Old Testament. There's a whole book of the Bible which, which is filled with wise sayings from a dad to a son. In the book of Proverbs, we find this verse in Proverbs 13, 20. It says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. It's a principle. What it means is if you hang out with wise people, you're going to become wise. It's just going to happen. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. If you hang out with people who are foolish, people who don't obey God, you, even by just hanging out with them, whether it's by your actions or your association with them, you'll either be influenced to do what they do, or you'll suffer just because you're friends with them. A companion of fools suffers harm. I want you to realize that you're moldable, and I know that takes some humility to recognize that I am actually molded by the people in my life. If you don't believe that, you should believe that because it's the truth. And if that's true, all right, let's just go with that. Let's just say, okay, I know that each and every person here is influenced by hundreds and thousands of people if we all combine all of our influencers together. Right? Thousands of people influence this group of people. Okay? Well, how do we figure out who's a good influencer and a bad influencer? Right? How do we figure that out? Well, Paul lists some of the stuff that the bad influencers do, but I want you to identify some of the good influencers you have. All right, I want you to write some things down. I want you to write down people in your life who you think are good influencers. People who do what God wants to do and then help you do the same. When Paul said, you should imitate me, he was not being prideful. Sounds prideful. He wasn't saying, hey, be like me and make sure you do your hairstyle like me. And make sure, you know, I've got this super sweet cloak. You should get one exactly like it. And everyone, we should get the same cloak. And we should come in and we should go all matchy-matchy. Right? That's not what Paul meant. Right? He's saying, imitate me. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says the same exact thing. But he adds something. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So, I'm saying you should follow your godly examples. Does that mean that you have to dress like them and walk like them? and wear the same shoes, and do your makeup the same way, and your hair the same way, and buy the same brands. No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. But you ought to follow your godly influencers as they follow Christ. Every influencer you have that's a godly influencer is sinful. That's the problem. So it's not like saying, okay, you should follow your parents' example. So anytime they do something bad, you get a free pass to do stuff bad too. That's not what the Bible says. That's why Paul adds that little, that little exception. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. But there are people in your life that are following Christ that you can look to. Ultimately, those people, Paul included, all your leaders in your life included, they are trying to follow Christ. Philippians 2, earlier in the book, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. And then the next verse he says, have this mind, so think that way, think selflessly, which is yours in Christ Jesus, because Jesus was selfless and humble. You gotta think like that. And you gotta follow the people who think like that too. Why don't you turn your Bibles to the right a little bit, to the book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. It's the long named book. First Thessalonians, we got the same author talking to a different group of people. These people are not in Philippi, they're in Thessalonica. They're sort of close by, not quite in the same region, but they're, cl they're semi-close. But he's going to tell them something about the way that he acted, that I want you to kind of use these verses to define in your life who's a godly influencer. So this is 1 Thessalonians 2.10. Check it out. 1 Thessalonians 2.10. It says, you are witnesses. It means you understood, you saw. And God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers, okay? Those three words, holy, righteous, blameless. Those are three good words that you should write down that describe how godly influencers in your life live, okay? Holy, righteous, blameless. Holy, righteous, blameless, okay? Does that mean they're perfectly holy all the time? No. Does that mean all they do is righteous things all the time? No. Does that mean they're blameless and they have never sinned in their life? No. But in general, the godly influence in, influencers in your life should be living a more holy life than you. A more righteous life. They're doing more right things than you. And they're also more blameless than you. 
They've done less things that people could call them on, generally speaking. And Paul says, that was true of me, and it was true of my friends that traveled with me. Now look at verse 11. He says, for you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. So I said three words that describe how they live, right? Holy, righteous, blameless. Well, there's three words that he gives right here in verse 11 and 12 that describe what they did, what Paul and his friends, the godly influencers, did to the people who they were influencing. So these are three things that these people ought to do with you. They ought to exhort you, encourage you, and charge you. Exhort you, encourage you, charge you to do something. To walk in a manner worthy of God. To be more holy. So, if you boil it down to this. Here are the godly influencers, godly influencers in your life. People who live a holy life. And people who help you live a holy life. People who live a righteous life. And people who help you live the righteous life. Those are the people you ought to follow. Encouraging, exhorting, charging. Those words are not very nice words. I don't know if you understand what those words mean. Encouragement, that's kind of the nicest one. But exhort means to correct the wrong things that you do. To say, hey, you're not doing this, you need to do this. Like a coach, like a personal trainer, yelling at you to do more sit-ups, right? Or, or push-ups, or you don't even need that, whatever, right? At the, at the gym. You got a personal trainer who's yelling at you, he's exhorting you. He's saying, you better do this, come on, you got it in you, you got it in you. You're encouraging you. Right? Charging, right? That's pushing you to do something, right? That's challenging you, right? The godly influences in your, influencers in your life are not just people who say, oh, you're so great. Right? Sometimes what they have to do is push you to do the right thing when you don't want to do it. They're people who are challenging you in your life. Also encouraging, right? The people who are building you up and helping you do those right things. That doesn't always feel fun. But those are people you should listen to. I said I wanted you to write down some of those people. It might be your small group leader. It might be your parents. It might be your coaches. It might be a godly mentor in your life. But here's the deal. While that's great, and we can all write those names down and say, great, we're going to follow them. Here's the deal. You might find them, but that doesn't mean that you're following them. A lot of you have godly influences in, in your life right now, yet you're not following them. You've got your parents who say, hey, you know what? You really need to be more respectful to your brother and sister. I know that's hard for you, but I need you. You need to do that or, or else you're going to be disciplined, right? Your parents might say that to you. Okay, right? You could take that advice and say, okay, I know that's good advice, but I'm not going to follow it, right? Then you found that godly influencer, but you're not following that influencer, right? Paul doesn't just say in Philippians 3, you should focus on those people. He does say that, but he says you've got to be imitators too. It's not just identifying things you need to do. It's also about putting it into action and doing it. You need to have those godly influencers. And I know some of you maybe come from harder situations where maybe your parents are not godly influencers. Um, that's why I really encourage you to be here on Wednesday nights because we have our leaders who will put you face to face in a small group right, with a small group leader or two. Right? Most of you have two unless you're in Bates's group or Caden's group and you only got one, but hey, two for the price of one, right? Um, or one for the price of two, I suppose. Anyway, you'll be influenced. I want to set you up in that position. But you have to take what they say too. You have to take what they say. People who live holy lives and help you live a holy life. I know you've got people in your life that will help you do that, but you have to listen. Paul says, you've got to follow those people because there are plenty of people in your life that would love to lead you in the other direction, in a direction that's not pleasing to God. In fact, I think that there's more people in your life right now, and this is just a guess, but I think it's a good guess. I think there's probably more people in your life right now who would like to lead you into sin and would like to lead you into participating in the sins that they're doing than people who are godly influencers. All right, you might have 25 ungodly sinful influencers, and you might have five or two godly influencers. That's okay. That's why he says keep your mind on those people. Because all throughout the world, there's people who would love to lead you astray. Back in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, Many of whom I've often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Right? He's not saying, hey, every sinful person, you need to hate them. Right? He's actually not saying that. He says, I, I weep over this. This is so sad. There are people who are disobeying God, and they're leading other people to disobey God. All, I mean, it's just sad on sad. It's a lose-lose situation with these people. 
Because not only do they sin, but they're also leading other people to sin. He says, and I, I, I cry about that. That's what Paul says. And then he describes them. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. You probably already figured this out, but the second point is this. I want you to avoid the appeal of sinful influencers. Avoid the appeal of sinful influencers. It doesn't just mean you avoid them altogether. In some cases it does. But many of them will be in your life where they're in your life, but you have to avoid the appeal. What does that mean? It means that there's a natural attraction that you have to do wrong things. Okay? There's a natural attraction that you, in fact, have to people who are doing things that God doesn't like. That's a very simple way of putting it. It sounds like I'm you know, talking to a first grader to say that, right? There's a feeling, you've got temptations, you've got desires that you have that make you want to do the wrong thing, right? You could all identify those. You say, well, you know, I want to lie to my parents. I want to cheat. I, there's plenty of things I want to do that are wrong, that I know are wrong, but I feel like I want to do them. Right? Well, James chapter 1, verse 14 says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. So here's the problem. Many people will take what we just said about sinful influencers, and they'll say, my sin is not my fault. It's not my fault. Because I've got parents who do bad things. Or all my friends do bad things. It's not my fault. Here's the deal. The Bible doesn't let us get off with that. Because James 1 says, well, that might be true, right? And those people aren't helping you. But ultimately, every time you choose to do the wrong thing, it's because you are lured and enticed by your own desire. And here's what the next verse says. This is James 1, 15. It says, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Okay? That's a figurative way of saying, imagine, you, you know, you've got this little baby, right, growing in a mother's womb. It's conceived, it gives birth to sin. So when you think about, oh, yeah, you know what, I do want to do that bad thing. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do want to. You know what, I bet I, maybe I could get away with that. Right? And you think about it. You keep thinking about it. Right? What does that lead to? Sin. That action that you're going to do that's bad. And then the verse goes on to say, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Right? If you stay in your desires and think, okay, yeah, I just got to want these bad things. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Right? And then you do the sin. Right? It says, when sin is fully grown, if you keep giving into the sin, you're doing the sin day after day, habit after habit, thing after thing after thing, what does that lead to? Right? Death. That's why back in the passage it says, for these people, the end is destruction. I know that sounds harsh and, and rough, but that's what the Bible says over and over again. When you think about something being destroyed, you probably think about um, you know, something that works, and then it's destroyed, and then it sits there, and it doesn't work. Right? Um, well, that might be true about things like a you know, phone screen breaking. Right? It's destroyed once it's broken, right? and then it's untouched. The problem is that when the Bible talks about destruction, it's not just talking about a point in time destruction. It's talking about a period of time of destruction, that you're being destroyed. What Matthew 25 says in 2 Thessalonians 1.8 says, the punishment that he's talking about, destruction here, for people who are enemies of the cross, people who oppose what Jesus do, does, their end is not just a temporary destruction or a point in time destruction, it's eternal destruction eternally being destroyed. That's what it means when people are in hell. It means that they're eternally being destroyed. God is working out a punishment that is exacted on them based on what they've done. Not any more than they deserve, not any less than they deserve. But he's working that punishment out. But the problem is that punishment doesn't stop. Because God is so good and he's so holy and breaking his rules is such a big deal. That's the punishment that's required. Ultimately, if you were following someone who was leading you down a road that was going to lead you off a cliff, I hope that eventually you'd say, okay, well, it's a fun ride, but I'm getting off at some point. Right? Here's the problem. I think with a group this size, I would think that many of you are following people and following influencers, whether it's people in your extended family, whether it's people in your small group, whether it's people at school, whether it's people online, whether it's people in music, social media, and movies, you are being led, and you're willingly, be, willingly giving yourself to being led 
all the way off a cliff. For their end is destruction. And for people who are being led in that way, just recognize that what we've been teaching for the last few weeks in the book of Philippians is available to you. You're able to be saved. Jesus is able to save you. He's able to turn you off that road. Right? That's why we use the word repentance. It's a great word when it comes to our whole, you know, are we there yet road analogy. Think about it. Repentance, what it means is to do a U-turn, to turn around. He says right now, if you want to, you can make a U-turn. You can turn to him and you can trust in him and you can be one of his people and he will keep you forever. But you've got to turn from that sin and those sinful influencers. You've got to do that. Like I said, you've got people at school who are sinful influencers. I want you to just think through that. Right? I told you to write down that first group of people. You don't have to write these people down, but I at least want you to think through who are the sinful influencers in my life. People who are not leading me to do the right thing, people who want me to do the wrong thing. Could be people at school. Could be people who are your cousins or in your extended family. Could be part of the music you listen to right? or the movies you watch. Right? It's not just people you know. If you think about the music you listen to and you start looking at what the lyrics are saying and the message it's trying to get across, what kind of message is that? Is that a message that reflects right here, verse 19, Philippians 3.19, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. Right? A lot of the music you listen to probably leading you in that direction. Probably a lot of the movies you watch are leading you in that direction. Right? Maybe not all of you. Maybe not all the music you listen to. It's, it's not all bad. A lot of it can be helpful and good. But if that's what you're filling your mind with, just know that that's where you're being led. You can also trace your sin oftentimes back to the influences you have. Right? Not that it's their fault. Right? Like we said earlier, James 1 says, our sin is always our fault. It's always when we choose to do the wrong thing. It's never anybody else's fault. It's our fault. But if you're a person who says, you know what? I know what I do wrong is saying bad words. I know it. I use curse words. I say bad words. I cuss at school. And I know that's the wrong thing to do. Okay. Good for identifying that. Now, how do we get past that? How do we move past that? Right? If I asked you, who are the people that you hang out with? What kind of words do they say? And if you're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, they actually use those bad words too. Right? Okay, well, bingo. Right? You are being influenced to say bad words. So, what Matthew 5 says is, if you really care about how bad sin is, you're willing to cut off relationships. You're willing to cut off things that lead you to do the wrong thing. Right? That's got to be worth it if the end is destruction. Some of you who struggle with bad words, it's not just the people you hang out with. It's the gaming videos you watch. It's the YouTube videos you watch. It's the blogs you watch. The vlogs you watch. the influences that you have. So others of you, the sin might not be bad words. Maybe the sin is disrespect. Maybe it's disobedience. Right? And if you started asking around, you started really thinking about it, the people in your life are people who are constantly disrespecting and disobeying authority. Their parents, their teachers. They complain about their teachers. They misbehave at school. There are people who complain about their parents to you. If those are the people you're surrounded with, don't be surprised if you do the same thing. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be deceived. What he's going to say, he says, this is hard to believe. And some people say, ah, this isn't true. This might be true for most people, but it's not true for me. Okay? Here's what he says. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. The people you hang out with, right? if their morals, and all that means is the, the truth that you've been taught. Right? You know right from wrong. Right? Many of you do. Some of you might not, but many of you have good morals. And what that means is you've been taught this is right, this is wrong, and I want to at least try my best to do what's right and not do what's wrong. Here's what this says. Do not be deceived. Don't be tricked. If you hang out with bad company, that will corrupt your good morals. How does that work? Right? You've always grown up saying, hearing from your parents, you know, there's certain movies we don't watch. There's certain songs we don't listen to. Right? Okay. You say, oh, we're not going to do that. Fine. Then, your bad company, what that means is you hang out with people who do that, and they say, well, it's not, they influence you to say, well, that's not so bad. I mean, I know I was taught I wasn't supposed to do that, but, I mean, I don't know, they do it. 
they don't seem too bad. And now what has happened? This bad company has corrupted your original decision not to do something wrong. Bad company corrupts good morals. That's how it works. It can work in a lot of other ways, but the idea is if you hang out with people who are sinful, don't be surprised if you start tracing sins back in your life. That's why I say don't be led to the appeal of sinful influencers. It doesn't mean that all of them, you've got to cut every last one of them out of your life completely and say, I'm never going to talk to you again. It's not what it means. But what it does mean is the appeal that they have in your life, just stop. Just realize it's not, it's not worth it. Book of Proverbs, again, this is Proverbs 23, 17. Proverbs 23, 17 says, let not your heart envy sinners. Have you ever been tempted when you look at sinful people and people who live worldly lives and they're popular and they're pretty and they're rich and they got a lot of stuff and they got a lot of followers and they got a lot of fans and you look at their life and you say, wow, I wish I was them. I wish I looked like them. I wish I could do the stuff they do. I know that they, they don't have to respect their parents. They don't care about any of that. I just wish I could be like that. Right? If you got honest, I think you'd, all of us would have people in our life that we'd look to and say, ah, oh, sometimes I wish I was like them. Right? This says, don't envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Just remember, God sees, God knows, and those people, they're not escaping God's judgment. They're not getting out of it. Right? Those people are not in a better situation than you. Most of them, they're in a worse situation than you. It's a good thing that God has kept you from sin. I want you to avoid the appeal of those people. I want you to turn to one more passage. Book of Ephesians. Go to the left. It's only like two pages. If you're in the book of Philippians, just go to the left. The book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Paul says essentially the same thing, but he gives a different illustration. And I want you to picture this because it's really helpful to picture. If you look at verse 6, it's Ephesians 5, 6. Ephesians 5, 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Notice how he says that again. Like People will want to tell you this is not true. Like, don't be deceived. It says, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Okay? Because of what things? If you look up in verse 5, you've got things like sexual immorality, impurity, coveting, right? wanting stuff that other people have. It says, that is idolatry. Right? Spending your time, your effort, your money, in your desire, in your love, trying to worship something else, whether it's sports or music or money or food or whatever, idolatry. It says, God's wrath is coming because of that stuff. It says, therefore, verse 7, do not become partners with them. Why would you become partners with people who are doing things that God is going to come back to judge? It doesn't make any sense. You don't want to be with those people. Verse 8, for at one time, you were darkness. It doesn't say you were in darkness. It says you were darkness. It's a metaphor, which is basically saying, it's like you were totally in darkness. You didn't understand. You didn't know. It says, but now you are light in the Lord. He's talking to Christians. He's not talking to non-Christians. You're light in the Lord. So walk as children of light for the fruit of light. If you want to know what light is, he defines it right here. It's found in whatever is good and right and true. What's the opposite of good, right, and true? Bad. Wrong. False, right? I just came up with that right now. I don't know. But like, if you want to know what darkness is, it's whatever's bad, whatever's wrong, whatever's false, right? Well, whatever's good, right, and true, that's what God wants you to do if you're a Christian. And then it says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Try to figure out what God would really like you to do. And there's a way for you to do that. Romans 12 says we can discern the will of God through the Bible. We can know what God wants us to do because we have a book that tells us what God wants us to do. Verse 11. This is Ephesians 5.11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. Right? There's things that people do in, in secret that I'll never even say out loud. Right? That's what he says. It's shameful to even talk about it. Right? But just know, your job as a Christian is not to partake in that. You'd never want to come in and be like, oh yeah, I want to partner with that. I want to do that. You'd never want to do that. Right? Even in things that you think are as innocent as just trying to self-promote. Just trying to put yourself out there so that everyone will like you. 
just trying to be the class clown and tell that inappropriate joke. And you think, oh, that's kind of harmless. Just take no part in that. Speaking of that, if you look up in the text, verse 4, or verse 3, it says, but sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you. It says, I don't even want to find out that any of you were doing any of the three of those things. It says, as is proper among saints. You might say, ooh, well, hold on, hold on. I'm not a saint, right? I don't got a little halo, right? I kind of do with the lights right now, but when I get out, I don't have a halo, right? I'm not a saint. I just, don't call me a saint, right? Well, here's the thing. The Bible, if you're, if you're a Christian, the Bible does call you a saint. So you got to live like a saint. Verse 4 says, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving, right? This section is awesome, and we're going to turn to it in small groups on Wednesday night. We're not, actually, we've got guys and girls workshop, whatever. I want you to turn to it before then, because it's really helpful. And you can start to identify things that you do that might be darkness, but God calls you to be in light. You know, darkness and light, two different things, reminds me of how many, how many of you actually play two sports. Any of you guys play two sports out there? You got like a spring and a winter, or um, summer and fall, and then you got spring and winter in a different sport. Well, for me, I played two sports growing up, and the two sports were not compatible. They actually messed up one or the other. Um, it was golf and baseball. Um, but here's the deal. In baseball, you never want to dip your shoulder and swing underneath it. That's bad. But guess what? In golf, that's what you have to do. You have to dip your shoulder, right? And in baseball, you want to swing down on the ball, right? You've got to go hands first. In golf, you don't do that. So basically, if you played baseball well, your golf was terrible. If you played golf well, your baseball was terrible, right? I couldn't play both at the same time very well. At some point, I had to choose. Here's what the Bible says. You used to walk in darkness and sin and selfishness, right? Yeah. But if you're a Christian, you walk in light. It's different now. You got to focus on this because the more you focus on that old stuff, it's harming what you're doing. It's harming the real goal of what you have. Don't be brought in by the temptation to play that old sport again. Right? Like I said, there's plenty of people in your life that will influence you to do the wrong thing. Plenty that will also influence you to do the right thing. I want you to set yourself up in the position to be doing exactly what God wants you to do, which means that for many of you, you're going to have to stop following some people, whether it's on social media, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's the music you listen to, or the friends that you have. Some of you might actually have to stop if you really want to do what God wants. But all of you, I know, have to find those godly influencers and do what they say. It's always going to be worth it. I'm going to pray.